Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of The Matrix Resurrections. Whether you found this fourth Matrix film artfully self-aware, or your feelings were a bit mixed, as all Matrix sequels are pretty much coded to make us feel, there is no denying that this film was crafted with fascinating attention to detail that I'm gonna break down scene by scene for all the awesome hidden glitches in this Matrix that no one seems to be talking about. So from the get-go, the Warner Brothers logo flips green over the sunny Warner Studio lot in Burbank, right down the street from me currently. This was altered from the 1999 film, which also cast the Warner lot in green, suggesting that that was starting in the Matrix itself. But like this new simulation in the fourth film, the sunny city of San Francisco is really a glitzier illusion than the dull green color tones that dominated the simulation in the original trilogy, which really should be a tell because SF is never this sunny. Really, this whole film is a meta commentary on the impact the first Matrix film had on culture and on the way Warner Brothers in particular has tried to capitalize on that nostalgia. Then we open again with the reigning green code, but now the code ascends to form the word resurrection and the S sneaks in delayed to tease us that this is really about more than one resurrection. Then like the opening of the first film, we open with a trace program, the text reading modal 101. Now a modal is a light box window that displays in front of other page content, a frame within a frame. And 101 was Neo's apartment number in the 1999 film, which itself was a nod to the torture room of George Orwell's 1984 and gave us some neat parallels with Neo being the one while Trinity's hotel room here being 303. We see the same phone number on the trace, 312, a Chicago area code, 555-0690, but now the voices of Bugs and Seek. Looks like old code. It feels really familiar. I love the name wordplay, Bugs of course referring to Bugs in code, but also Bugs Bunny, a wisecracker who escapes via random portals. My name is Bugs, as in Bunny. In tech that listens. And seek for Sequoia, but also someone who seeks. Unlike the operators from before, he projects his visual form into the simulation, a sign of how technology has advanced over the past 60 years. Whereas before the green zero led directly to the cop's flashlight, now we begin in the puddle where you can see some raining green code on the walls. But since this is a reflection, the raining code in this reflection is actually ascending on that wall. This is all going down once again in the heart of the city hotel. And outside the exchange is similar. I think we can handle one little girl. They're bringing her down now. No, Lieutenant, your men are already dead. I think we can handle one little girl. My men are bringing her down now. No, Lieutenant. Your men are already dead. Here, the Agent Smith line is spoken by Morpheus, but a modal version of this identity that Neo actually infused with the Smith script. And since this is a modal Morpheus, he's not Lawrence Fishburne, but Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. Bugs and Seek watch the whole Trinity scene go down from outside the modal, serving as stand-ins for us, as they are wondering why we are seeing this iconic imagery again, and who is really manipulating our nostalgia in this moment. We know the story. This is why he began. Modal Trinity runs past a sign reading Sabor a Mier or taste of shit in Spanish. And then Bug slides down a sign reading Anderson's for those who love to eat shit, referring to Neo's Thomas Anderson identity, this being his in joke about being forced into a role of a corporate drone who has to eat shit. Bugs hides in a key cutter shop, recalling the key maker from Reloaded, who introduced us to the whole idea of a hallway of back doors through which this Morpheus agent now grabs Bugs and ends up in Neo's old apartment. There's the same blinking cursor on the monitor, his old meta Cortex employee badge. And then we get this confusing exchange. Do you understand that you are digital sentience? I know what I am. Just like I know my job is to hunt down and destroy sentience like you. While it sounds like Yaya is saying sentience, HBO's captions read, my job is to hunt down and destroy sentience like you. Bugs is not a sentient, sentience being the machines who defect to join the humans like Sabede and Illuminate. And Neo, who built this modal, does not seem to learn what sentience are until he meets sentience in the real world later on. So here's what I think is going on here. Neo built this whole modal to try to make sense of the deja vu he's been feeling by his various dreams. In this case, the dream of Trinity's escape from the agents. And by creating this modal, that's what alerts humans like Berg to find him. Because otherwise, the semblance masked him from ever being found. He's been coding these memories into the design of his games, but he created this modal to experiment with different variables of how it really went down. Because think about it, he was not actually present for Trinity's escape from the agents. He only ever dreamed this, which the 1999 movie suggested by cutting straight from Trinity's escape to Neo waking up in that first scene. And now part of this modal experiment was to fuse Morpheus's identity with the Agent Smith script and the test 
out that variable. And then at some point, Neo, through his searching, came across the word sentient, did not understand what it was, and then ran a new modal loop, inserting it into the script in order to try to define it. But then when he fused Morpheus with the Smith code, that caused this program to glitch and to start to see the code leading to this Morpheus's red pilling. Now, when Bugs recalls seeing Neo, notice how Morpheus removes his earpiece, like when Smith removed his earpiece in the first film when he went off script. Bugs reveals that she was a window washer on the day of Neo's suicide attempt. Of course, the window washer carriage being Morpheus's directed escape from Metacortex in the first film, the path that Neo did not take. And notice how at first, Bugs sees him as a bald man, a completely different avatar than the mask Neo is later shown to have in the mirror, showing how to each person actually Neo looks different and that this semblance program is working in all different kinds of ways to keep his actual appearance a mystery. Meanwhile, Morpheus recalls seeing raining code on the droplets of his mirror. As we saw in the first movie, droplets on glass always reflecting the raining code of the simulation. Briefly, we see him eating in that same House of Nanking restaurant where Neo later meets Sati and where Trinity often attends. We also see him running on a treadmill, their synonym for a loop. And then Morpheus's mirror ripples the same way Neo's did in the mirror in the first film. And Bugs offers him the red and the blue pill choice, but she deconstructs what this really means. The choice is an illusion. You already know what you have to do. Now, as Morpheus trips, Bugs gives him the blue tinted glasses. I've never worn different glasses before. Yeah. A meta joke about their wearing sunglasses all the time in the older films, but now uses a practical way to help an extracting being keep their grip on the blue pill simulation. A backdoor leads out of a cinema playing The Root of All Evil, starring Lito Rodriguez. Lito Rodriguez is a character in the Wachowski series Sense8, and The Root of All Evil, referring to man's love of money, another dig at this reboot really being driven by capitalistic greed by the movie studio. And then as they fall from the building, Morpheus' screams go electronic. <laughs> the same way Neo's scream transitioned during his red pill moment. Then we find Neo as Thomas Anderson, a game developer in this simulation who has taken all the memories we have seen of the Matrix films and this simulation has turned them into a game that this guy has created and won awards for. A way of tricking him and all the people in this reality who might remember events from the Matrix and anytime they tried to talk to anybody about that, they would just say, you mean those video games? The company through which they do all this is another mean joke to Thomas Anderson because they call it Deus Machina, referring to Deus Ex Machina, which was the name of the Machine Central Enterprise face that Neo met in Revolutions. Now, in our world, Deus Ex Machina refers to the god and the machine, which is an old Greek drama term where they would lower actors in via crane when they were playing gods to rescue the heroes from their crises. In our storytelling lexicon, it refers to divine intervention. You'll notice how Matrix memorabilia covers his desk. We see a figurine of Trinity's jump and reloaded, a sentinel, a hand giving the finger, just like Neo flipped off Smith. There's also a bunch of DC superhero figurines covering everything. And then we see a Game of the Year award for 1999, which is the year the first film came came out, though the Game of the Year awards actually only started in 2014. So this is an example of a design flaw of the Matrix, creating this false history for Neo in which he supposedly created all these games. Neo and Jude attend the Simulate coffee shop, calling all these things simulation just to address them head on so that Neo just thinks he's overthinking everything. And then here, Jude geeks out on the Matrix, totally echoing all the real world fanboy sentiments that Lana Wachowski's probably heard about for years, reading them in online forums. And then he forces Neo to talk to Trinity but now here named Tiffany is a nod to Audrey Hepburn's breakfast at Tiffany's until her husband shows up. This is my husband, Chad. Nice to meet you. Hey. Yes, Chad is credited as Handsome Chad, a cameo by Chad Shalesky, John Wick director, who previously worked as Keanu Reeves' stunt double in the first Matrix. Chad, of course, is also an insult term for the handsome basic dudes who pick up the women that they don't really deserve, thus Jude's scowl at him. And you'll notice how Trinity's kid is dressed in all blue, blue hat, blue backpack, and she follows them out, leaving Neo behind, showing how Trinity is still on the blue pill track. Back in his office, Neo's modal gets purged, and notice the error code reads, missing file morph BLD EXE heart to owe the city, showing how the real point of this modal was to try to figure out who exactly Morpheus was. Then Neo's boss, Smith, now played by Jonathan Groff, quotes Hugo Weaving Agent Smith's line to Morpheus from the original film. Billions, Billions of people, people just, just living out their, living lives. Out their lives. Oblivious. He has a bust in his office, recreating that slow-mo punch from Revolutions. And notice that he offers Neo a smoke, recalling how Smith in Reloaded actually copied over the Oracle, who's always smoking like a chimney. Now, since, of course, the Smith code rebooted as Neo's boss in this simulation, kudos to Jonathan Groff for capturing the vocal enunciations of Hugo Weaving in such a cool way. Just with different names, different faces. 
Yeah, that grunt on names and that puff on faces. Just some really great acting by Groff here. Smith says that their first meeting was like an FBI interrogation. During this, Neo flashes back to the mouth melt scene from the first film, and then Smith explains, I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. What? They informed me they're gonna do it with or without us. I love this because this whole fourth Matrix film really came about because after years of asking the Wachowskis again and again to do a fourth film, and every time the Wachowskis refused to do it, eventually the studio Warner Brothers really did plan to move forward with a fourth film without the Wachowskis, to which Lana Wachowski relented and said, okay, fine, I'll do it. Ah, uh, yeah. I guess I did. <laughs> but probably under the condition that Lana could just make fun of Warner Brothers as much as they wanted. And then at his therapist's office on the Russian Hill neighborhood in San Francisco, which I hiked to like a huge nerd, Neil Patrick Harris plays the analyst, the architect of this new matrix. Maybe it's not as binary as that. Yes, the word binary. Binary is, of course, the name of Thomas's new game series, reflecting the ones and zeros of binary code that make up all of this, but also how Smith sees him and Neo as a binary pair. But I would argue this film overall is saying Neo and Trinity don't really fall into that. They aren't opposing complements of each other, one on, the other off, but rather they share the same soul. In a way, they are post-binary. They break the loop. They do not correspond to code. You'll notice the analyst is framed in blue. Blue framed glasses, a blue sweater, blue butterfly framed on the shelf, and he prescribes blue pills, the pills that keep you part of the program. And if you look closely, the bottle label reads ontolifloxin. That is based on the term ontology, which is a branch of metaphysics that explores the nature of being. And when Neo takes these pills in the mirror, his reflection shows a completely different man than before. This is actually actor Stephen Roy in real life Carrie Ann Moss's husband. This is such a cool meta way of showing that Neo's true self is really meant to be someone partnered with Carrie Ann Moss Trinity. Now, if you're like me and spend a lot of days staring at screens, you might notice sore eyes and problems sleeping. Blue light damages our eyes and leads to digital eye strain, the symptoms of which include blurred vision, headaches, and dry, watery eyes. For some folks, this can even affect your energy level. Well, Blue Blocks was created to fix this problem and block out the blue light with some high quality lenses. Thank you to Blue Blocks for sponsoring this video. Blue Blocks are evidence backed and made under optics laboratory conditions in Australia. When I'm spending time in fluorescent lighting, staring at screens. These glasses are a huge help. They have over 40 styles of frames and come in prescription, non-prescription, and readers. Blue Blocks also has other amazing products such as low blue light bulbs, red light therapy devices, and sleep masks that I'm a huge fan of. They ship worldwide in rapid time and make returns and exchanges easy. So go to blueblocks.com slash new rockstars and use the coupon code new rockstars to save 20%. That's blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com slash new rockstars and use the coupon code new rockstars to save 20% off. And thanks again to Blue Blocks for sponsoring this episode. Christina Ricci plays marketing executive Gwyn DeVere and leads a super repetitive brainstorming montage, all set to the music of Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit, keeping, of course, with the series Alice in Wonderland motif and includes lyrics on pill popping. This song was also memorably featured in another SF set film, The Game by David Fincher, in which a protagonist is similarly gaslighted the whole time. Neo notices the odd flight pattern of the birds. He loops on his treadmill. He he fights in his home along to the movie Fist of Legend, which is a big influence that led to the Wachowskis seeking out Yuen Wu Ping to fight choreograph the first film. Wish they got him back for this one. But I love how the looped conversations have this really cool transition here. She's right. Matrix is mind born. Philosophy in shiny type BBC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that yeah. developer sentence rolls right through a jump cut to him in an entirely different meeting to show me how Neo finds himself in the same looped debate again and again over the Matrix's real deeper meaning. And of course, these dopes show up again in a post credit scene to pitch the cat tricks. In the bathroom, the toilet paper is labeled pull for an arts degree. And the people wrote, look right, look left. On the door is written master bait up for a good time call 818 Walpo something. There's a sticker. This guy is the Resurrections co-cinematographer, John Toll, who actually worked on Cloud Atlas and Sense8. And then this quote, it is so much simpler to bury reality than it is to dispose of dreams. This is from Don DeLillo, postmodernism author, directly from his book Americana from 1971, which investigates films ability to misrepresent reality, which is basically the thesis of this film. Then in that House of Nanking restaurant, Thomas meets adult Sati, the kid from Resurrections. She's reading Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass and contrasting the analyst, she wears red framed glasses, the color trying to break you out of the simulation. Now, if you remember back in the first Matrix film, Neo pointed to a restaurant that served great noodles. This could be that restaurant. During this montage, they modulate the song. 
Yeah, the word fall echoes. Fall, 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 fall. Triggering Neo's suicide attempt. During this, Neo eats a medium rare steak looking delicious. Calling back Cypher's delicious looking steak that he eats when he betrays Morpheus to the agents. Neo sits in a bathtub with a rubber ducky on his head, a reference to rubber duck debugging, where a coder would keep a rubber duck by his desktop so that he could explain each step of his debugging to the duck. Neo and Trinity chat at Simulate, where that barista is named Scrochi, named after comic artist and storyboarder Steve Scrochi, who drew the precise storyboards famously used to pitch that first Matrix film to Warner Brothers that eventually won over the studio to greenlight this ambitious film concept. Tiff says about her husband, Chad, I wanted to kick him so hard. Not too hard, maybe just hard enough to break his jaw off. Foreshadowing how she handles that analyst at the end of the film. And if you look closely, Neo sees a reflection in that coffee table. She too has a different face and head of hair, showing how she also looks different to the rest of the world, the Matrix hiding Trinity's real identity, and why Chad laughed at her for seeing a resemblance between herself and Trinity in the game. Now back at Deus Machina, the developer on the left is a cameo by Donald Mustard of Epic Games and Fortnite. And then Neo gets the same kind of text as that phone call he got from Morpheus while in Metacortex in the 1999 film. And then he finds Morpheus in the bathroom. At last. <sighs> I wasn't too sure about the callback, but you know, it's just hard to resist. What? Morpheus Uno, reveal at the window, lightning, thunder, and theater. Yes, he's referring to the whole theatricality of Neo's first meeting with Morpheus in the 99 film. At last. Then Smith walks into the shootout and only upon picking up the Desert Eagle Mark 19 pistol does his original coding return and take over. Mr. Anderson! No. Yeah, he cracks his neck, recalling Agent Smith cracking his neck during that subway fight. And he says, Mr. Anderson, the simulation name that Smith insisted on calling Neo, flashing back to Smith's scream during their final battle in Revolutions. Here, Neo sees the Deja Vu cat, and he returns to the analyst's office, where we learn that cat is actually named Deja Vu, another part of the analyst's gaslighting to justify why Neo would associate a black cat with the word Deja Vu, just like how he made him think all of his Matrix experiences were just from the video game. We see the rooftop party that Neo flashes back to was actually lined with red and bright blue blue color decor, triggering him for red pilling and blue pilling. All those servers were even dressed in Neo's clothes from Reloaded. But back at night, Bug stops Neo from jumping, referring to herself as any other copper top, which was Switch's term for plugged in human batteries from the first film. And then Bugs warns, They don't look like typical Asians. They use bots now skinned as normal people, which means they're everywhere and you never know who to trust. Another commentary about how many social media users are really just bots. And she reveals her rabbit tattoo, calling back to Jor's rabbit tattoo. Also, you'll notice Bugs' shirt shows a carrot. Goes, What's up, Doc? Bugs and Seek take Neo through a portal to this Tokyo train, saying they don't have to run to phone booths anymore, referring to the landlines they previously used. And very briefly, as they whiz past those cherry blossoms, you'll notice some green code streaks by showing how using moving portals glitches the system. So they bring Neo into the cinema, projecting footage from the 1999 film, The Red Pill Scene, which in this case was just a cut scene from Thomas's game. That tear right down the screen divides Morpheus's hands, which are also divided into the red pill side and the blue pill side in his mirror sunglasses and Neo reaches out for the pill, but we get another parallel sync with that film. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Wait. Yeah, Neo says wait, the same time Morpheus did before. As Neo learns more about what happened, Morpheus teases that theory that Neo might have actually been working with the machines, referencing the theory that some fans had that since we learned that the Neo we've been following was really the sixth iteration of the anomaly, that all of this could have just been part of the coded loop that the machines wanted to happen. And as in his red pilling before, Neo touches a mirror and it ripples, but in this case, it connects him back to the analyst, alerting that analyst that Neo has been found. So they have to flee back on that bullet train where the machines activate a bot swarm. One passenger wears a mask covered in Japanese matrix code, but that pattern fills each of their eyes when they convert into bots. So Neo has to get unplugged and he boards the Nemesine or Nemesine. In Greek mythology, the Nemesine was the goddess of memory. They plug him back into the construct where Neo immediately touches the back of his head, just like he did upon entering the construct the first time, we see Morpheus' old TV set playing a series of clips from the past films. Morpheus transports him to the Lake Dojo, where he forces him to fight to combat the effects of the blue pill withdrawal. At one point, Yaya does a similar footwork that Lawrence Fishburne did when they fought before. Aboard the Nemesine, Bugs reveals that the Oracle had been purged, but that Neo and Trinity's sacrifices gave them a mixed peace. 
with some of the machines called Synthians. These include Sabebe, Obstacles, and Luminate. The crew includes the pilot Hanno, as well as Lexi, their neologist Berg, who is the one who found Neo's modal, Elster, she's the granddaughter of Roland from Reloaded and Resurrections, and of course we met Seek, Sequoia. He does not have plugs because he was born in the real world like Tank and Dozer were. Morpheus now appears as an exomorphic particle codex, similar to that machine interface of Deus Ex Machina in Revolutions, and they enter the new human city named Io, a moon of Jupiter, also from Greek mythology, the name of one of Zeus's mortal lovers, whom Hera was really jealous of, so Zeus transformed Io into a cow to hide her from Hera. Io went to all kinds of suffering, but she actually later gave birth to Zeus's children and became the ancestress to the great Greek hero of Heracles. But the word Io is essentially Zion with the Z and the N removed, making this city a kind of Zion, but with no beginning and no end. Jada Pinkett Smith returns as Niobe, who catches up with Neo. A long way from Dozer's paint stripper. Calling back the booze that Cypher gave to Neo that Dozer brewed. Good shit, huh? Dozer makes it. It's good for two things. Degreasing engines and killing brain cells. One of the many improved Sabores seen Mierda, thanks to the human synthient garden. We learn about Morpheus' election and the machine civil war, and Neo meets Shepard, who mentions that viral agent, referring to when Smith used the human body of Bane to enter the real world and reload it in revolutions. They go back in, enter in a hotel room with a Viking bust. This prop was actually from Merovingian's mansion and reloaded, foreshadowing his coming return in the next scene. But first they run into Smith. Sounds like conflict. Inevitable. Yes, the word inevitable, calling back their battle and revolutions. There's nowhere I can't go. There is nowhere I won't find you. It's impossible. Not impossible. Inevitable. And so the exiles return, including the dirty Merovingian. We had conversation. Not this beep, 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 beep. You gave us space, Zukasaki. Neo says, I still know Kung Fu. Calling back his line in the first film. I know Kung Fu. Smith tackles them into the basement. Just like old times. As we flash back to their various duels throughout the trilogy, Neo and Smith actually mirror each other's attacks perfectly now, proving how well these two fighters know each other. Then Smith rapid punches his ribs, just as he did in the first film. Neo coughs up blood as he did in the first film as well. He finds Trinity, who melts into code, Deja Vu appears, and the analyst shows up. Allow me to sum up our goal in a single word. Bullet time. It's two words, but the analyst is echoing Jude's pitch to signal that Jude was really his puppet spying on Neo and that they both preached the same kind of shitty philosophy about preying on people's fears and their conspiracy beliefs the way in our world now online algorithms totally do to users. We have voluntarily plugged into the machines, but the sentient Kujaku brings Niobe and Neo to Sati who reveals that her father who we saw in Revolutions was one who built that anomaly that Neo and Trinity were sequestered in. So they mount a rescue and while they work to unplug Trinity, Neo meets Trinity at that Simulate shop. After a conversation, Trinity initially decides to go back with Chad and her kids, but Chad really makes the mistake of continuing to call her Tiffany, which is really the trigger that sets her off. I wish you would stop calling me that. I hate that name. My name is Trinity, and you better take your hands off of me. During the battle, one of the members of the crew is named Calliope. Calliope, take the wounded! This is actually a cameo by San Francisco Mayor London Breed. They flee the bot swarm to this rooftop where a helicopter unloads on them, the shells falling down on us, just like when Neo and Trinity fired at the agents holding Morpheus. After the explosion, Trinity awakens and sees that same flock of birds which shimmer into code. You can also see code raining down the nearby skyscraper, all showing how Trinity is really the second half of that anomaly who shares Neo's abilities. So when they leap, Notice how Neo panics and kicks through the air just as he did in his first jump program and he falls again while Trinity keeps her pose the entire time because she has bird-like confidence. And in the way that Neo broke the cycle to rescue Trinity back in Matrix Reloaded by walking out of the other door from the architect's room, it is really the love between these characters that makes them revolutionary. This is what the analyst was explaining when he said he needed both of them to be able to make this version of the Matrix. So they fly back to the analyst. Trinity breaks his jaw off. I love how you can see green code underneath the skin whenever she cuts him. And they thank him. You gave us something we never thought we could have. And what is that? Another chance. A 
and the music we hear is a female cover of Rage Against the Machines Wake Up, in this case by Brass, mirroring the end of the first film. And as they fly into the sunrise, they shatter that dumb flock of birds that representing the loop that they were trapped in, but not anymore. So I'm really curious to know all of your thoughts on this film. So leave those in the comments below and you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss, follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, sheeple.